I'm Katja Williams, the Rural Mum, and today we're talking with Alison about your farm office in our series, You've Married a Farmer, Now What? So thank you, Alison, for joining us today. Oh, absolute pleasure to be here and have a chat. <laughs> so Alice, can, can you please give us a background of where you started in farming from your childhood to where you are now? Sure, yes. So look, I'm a fourth generation farmer. Um, I grew up in a little town called Crookwell in the southern tablelands of New South Wales, um, where we were cattle producers. Uh, we had a stud, an Angus, uh, well, originally a Murray Gray stud and then an Angus stud. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's where I grew up. Um, I'm the eldest of three girls in my family and have always been a big part of the farm and um yeah absolutely loved it from a very very young age so yeah i guess farming is in my blood really <laughs> a great wealth of knowledge to be able to start talking about the farm office allison tell me where the ideas behind this new business for you came from and how you're helping others implement that yeah thank you look so i have been in business for myself for Oh, probably 12, 15 years now. Um, but it wasn't really until I I married my husband, but he's not a farmer. He's uh, an, a, uh, an arborist and we have a tree business, um, horticulture business in the Riverina. And it was a similar circumstance to what I had heard so many of my friends say when my mother-in-law handed me the books um, and said, good luck, here you go. This is what has to happen to, to run the admin side of um, Andrew's business. So from there, I, you know, it, it really resonated and I'd heard so many friends who had married farmers talk about this same scenario and the struggle they had with, you know, potentially not having the skill or the knowledge or the time. They were also juggling other work and children and other things. Um, so I set myself on a path after I actually got to a very low point. Uh, I had two little kids at the time, was trying to manage my own business, plus the admin for our tree business, juggling way too many hats and really got myself into a pretty deep hole of thinking I was doing nothing right, nothing well. Um, and yeah, things were falling through the gaps. So um, I either had to you know, step away from it or find a better way. So I decided to find a better way, set myself on a bit of a learning path to discover how I could manage the books, do it well, um, and also juggle the other hats of my own business, our small farm, two kids, other industry roles I was holding. Um, so when I did that, and I actually have found peace in um, my routine now, and I can actually manage all of those things, I thought I really want to share this with other people um, because I know there are others out there who are also feeling the same. So I set about and I set up um, the Functioning Farm Office, which started out just as a little Facebook group where I'd share tips, tricks, tactics, that kind of stuff to help people um manage and navigate their their farm office um and yeah well, that's where it really all began and it's been going now for yeah probably nearly close to two years so I love helping people love helping farmers that's a beautiful progression in coming up with an idea to help yourself and then move into the broader community that is absolutely fantastic so I guess where I'd like to start with that is can you tell me how you started to um, sort things out in your life to be able to give you the boundaries or the routine, as you said, to be able to juggle all the hats. Um, and then we might talk a bit more about how you then did the training to set up, um, you know, specifically for the books. But personally, for you to start with, um, where did you start? Look, this is a hard one. And honestly, I had to start with asking for help. Learning to say no was a big thing. I was I was doing way too much, and some of the things I was trying to fit into my life my life um, 
really didn't resonate, weren't serving a purpose. So I guess starting to say and learning to say no was the first thing. Learning to prioritise was probably the second thing, what was really important to me and, and what had to happen. Um, and then it was about finding the tools that would allow me to do that. Oh. So, um, you know, now I'm really strict on using my calendar and my schedule and I colour code it with all of the different hats that I wear. So that's a really big tool that I now use. So I, I've picked up lots of tools along the way, but I guess the two, the first two things really were learning to say no, actually asking for help. And I'm a pretty independent person and that didn't come naturally. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, learning to prioritise what really was important to me. Yeah. So how did you uh, work out what was important to you? Was that sitting down and looking at your values or was that sitting down and working out whether that was um, I'm not spending enough time with the kids or I'm not spending enough time in the business, not on the business, or how did that work? Yeah, look, it was a absolutely a combination of all of those things. I don't care what anyone says, but I'm certainly not a multitasker and I can't. I was, you know, paying wages, paying bills, as well as playing with the kids and doing all of these things and things just, mistakes were happening, things were not working out and it was causing, you know, uh, you know, issues because we were always talking about the business. Um, so I, um, yeah, became really clear on what was important to me, what my values were. And at that time, it really was family um, and, and what I was was doing. Um, so, yeah, becoming really clear on my own personal values was the, the nuts and bolts, I guess, of, of where that all started. Yeah. Yeah. So once you'd worked out that step, what was the next? The next big step was really then, I guess, um, getting some help and getting some training. So I actually set myself on a path of doing some short courses, some personal development, um, which has been game changing for me. It really helped me become clear on my goals, really clear on what was important to me um, and taught me how to be true to myself and true to my my values. So, yeah, I invested a lot of time and a lot of money in that um, to, to to educate myself on how to how to better do this. And the things that I have learned through that investment are the things that I'm now, I guess, reiterating and passing on in, in how I'm supporting other people in the functioning farm office. So, you know, there was a lot of practical tips in that, but also a lot of soul searching and a lot of um, realisation that to, to be my best and to give my best to my job and to my family and to all the hats that I was wearing, I had to really um, look after myself first. So that wasn't a priority back then, but now it is. <laughs> And I have realised that I'm a much better person. I operate far more effectively and efficiently and um, in, in a better place if I look after myself first. So I realised some of those priorities um, and really stuck true to them. And they now are, are solid routines in my in my schedule. Yeah. 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 And so starting with personal development, is there any courses or any steps that you would suggest people take first to start off with that step? Because a lot of the time, by the time we've reached this point of moving to the farm and needing to readjust to who we are and adjust to our values, sometimes we're a little bit lost. So whether we're lost um, and trying to find that or whether we are trying to get ahead of the game, yeah. Where would you start with that personal development? What did you find helped you? Yeah, and look, I think the first biggest thing is actually realising that I am worthy of investment in myself to do that. Um, that was the first big thing. And to be honest, I toed and froed and, you know, can I spend this money? Can I do this time on myself? You know, I had the guilts about that. So the first thing I would say really is, yes, we we, we operate in isolation in our farm offices and offers, often we don't have anyone to um, collaborate with, anyone just to download on. Um, we seem to suffer in silence when it comes to the admin. So, look, I guess the first port of call really is to perhaps, you know, tap into others in your community and family and friends and, and others maybe that are in similar circumstance um, and start talking about it. I think that's the first step. And you can actually learn a lot from others who are in the same situation. And I've really found that in the functioning farm office group, um, especially when I've run masterminds and have people with, you know, similar situations in a room together. 
the um the conversations are oh, wow it's not just me like oh my god they're feeling this too and you know people bounce off each other it builds momentum and um in people that you know there is a way through this and i've got someone here to support me so finding a group whether it be a local group or you know tapping into things you know that that really resonates support that really resonates um I think is the first step. And then it is really about, um, I guess, finding your groove in, in where it is that you do need help. And um, and that's where I started in my journey um, of changing all of this around. <laughs> yeah. And so for the practical farm office steps, um, knowing what you do now, where would someone go to find yourself or where would someone go to find that personal um sorry, that professional development for their farm mothers? Yeah. Look, I, well, I mean, I'd love for people to join my mastermind in the functioning farm office and we collaborate and we talk to others. But it really is first and foremost about um, getting a really good stock take of what it is you do in your farm office, where your skills lie, where your time is situated. So, you know, all of the other hats that you're juggling, are you working off farm, kids? What time do I actually have to give to the farm office? And what are the parts that I love doing and I want to keep hold of? And I'm really strong on delegating. If there are parts in that that you don't have the skills in doing, you don't enjoy doing, um, is this something I can delegate to either someone else with, else within my business or is it someone external? And the power of delegating and, and you know, Passing that on, if it's not your cup of tea, not your thing, um, can be really, really powerful. Um, so I don't know that that really answered your question, but it's 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 really a unique thing in terms of what training you need. But the first point really is is talking about it. Yeah, and that's because every farm different, every farm yeah. business is so different. Not in how, not only in how they operate, but also in how they do their books. And that's why once you've been in it long enough and start going down this journey, you can really tailor make it for yourself and for your business. Yeah. So, um, Alison, you know a fair bit, a little bit about the stud game as well. <laughs> so if someone was trying to not only do, you know, their baths and their balancing sheets, but also if you're having to run a stud, how do you then implement additional tasks into that to make sure that all the recording, all the genetics is not like is being handled in the most efficient way possible yeah look <laughs> the stud game is a game changer and the admin really tenfold um for for people in the stud game as you and i both know so um where I start with people in my journey really is to take a stock take of what it is that has to happen in your farm office. And then it's really about being proactive. So I know with the stud game, things have to happen in a at a certain time um, for you to get your data in and all the rest. Similar with your books, you know, you have to get your bass in on time. So it's really, I start with, by really categorising and becoming clear on what are the must-do tasks? What are the things that are going to, first of all, keep me out of jail and keep my business running? Um, yep. So, you know, for you and, and for the stud people, that is obviously the account side of thing and the bass, but it is also to keep your stud rolling, getting that data in accurately and on time. So I use a calendar and I schedule everything. And, um, you know, I have so many people come to me and say, you know, they're constantly getting things in the night before they're due or always running late. And that just causes chaos and anxiety and stress for everyone. So I think one yeah. of the first things you can do is really try to yeah, be clear on those must-do tasks and get them scheduled in your calendar early so that um, you're proactive as opposed to reactive with those kind of things. And being really realistic on the time it takes, like yeah. You know, is this a one hour job, a two hour job, a three hour job? What time do I need to set aside to do this? I think we can fall into a trap if we, um, you know, are trying to do a three hour job in half an hour. Like yeah. that's when mistakes happen. That's when, um, you know, things fall fall off the off the wheel. So, um, yeah. yeah, there are a couple of tips for for managing that. But, yeah, being proactive. Yeah. 
No, I absolutely love that. In some of my other videos and things that I found helpful moving to the farm and, and taking on some of those jobs is I do write everything on my calendar. Yeah. And I know that it's, you know, sometimes a pain point, you know, yeah. for those pesky paddock books when they keep turning up all over the house or or everyone's always looking for them. But um, we record some of the most amazing data in those books. Yeah. So if we can, whether that is, you know, what we've used to do a job, whether it was the time to do a job, whether it was, um, you know, what cattle we sold and when and whether they were registered and, you know, who they were, their identification. So yeah. if we're setting aside some time uh, to be able to go through those, plot them on our calendar so next year we know, okay, we did this in our business last year. We're coming up to that. The same for, you know, you have to report, particularly in the stud game, you know, you have to report your numbers and your identification and your DNA, yeah. usually the same time every year. So as you said, it shouldn't be a surprise when it comes yeah. up. It should be yeah. set in the calendar. Yeah. The same for, you know, if you're having to do vaccinations and, and all of that for shows or for sale, Let's yeah. plot it out on the calendar so we all, we can all see it, we can yeah. all talk about it, and we know that it's coming. It's not a surprise. Totally. But, yes, starting to accumulate that data is either through, you know, talking with your partner about what's yeah. going on, seeing and yeah. hearing what's going on the farm, yeah. start writing it down, start adding it to a calendar, whether that's a paper calendar, an online calendar. Yeah. It all helps in the long run. And even totally. if it's just season to season, you're not having to make guesswork of what's coming up. Um, and that does take time, but every year it will make something easier. Totally agree. Totally agree. And look, I've seen some amazing operational calendars, either on big whiteboards or, as you say, just on your calendar, whether it be on your computer or a paper-based calendar. But systems and processes are a big part of what I, I really advocate for. And um, the more you can be proactive in those systems, when things have to happen and how they have to happen, particularly yeah. if you employ staff as well, you know, you don't want to be continually having to train them every year or every season when new jobs come along. So systems and processes are really, really big. And the other thing you touched on was communication, and that is gold. If you, The more communication you can have with, um, you know, people within your business um, about what's on this week, what's on this month, what's on this quarter, what's on this season, and be on the front foot and really effective in that in, you know, terms of who does what, who's got the best skills for what, even things like, you know, running to town to get vaccine, like who's going to be doing that um, when they're in town as opposed to making a special trip kind of thing. Like yeah. all of those things are such big time savers. Um, and all it is is, you know, some really effective and regular communication. So, yeah. yeah, love that. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, last thing you'd want is for the cattle to be in the yard and you're having to make a special trip into town to try and grab it <laughs> <Yeah>. straight away. <laughs> I know. And, look, so many assumptions are made. You know, I thought you were getting that. No, I thought you were getting that. And <laughs> I think we're not mind readers. And I think when it comes to farming, you know, we do hold a lot of information or people within the business hold a lot in their heads and assumptions are made. And particularly for people who are, you know, coming in, marrying into a farm, you know, those assumptions are, you know, a whole different world to them. They've got no idea of reading what the heck the others in the business want. So, yeah, yeah don't assume anything um, and communication couldn't be yeah. couldn't be bigger tips. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And those those conversations as well, you know, that communication, it doesn't have to be formal communication. As I said in, you know, Claire and I were talking about in one of our other interviews in season one, you know, that could just be conversations on the back of the ute. That could be conversations mm -hmm. over Smoko. But they're worth recording those little gems of information yeah. and those little, you know, yeah. little seasonal tips and jobs. Totally agree. Totally agree. And, yeah, look, the more you can get that out and get that really transparent, the better. So, Alison, we've talked about, you know, where to start the process, finding out, you know, our values, our time constraints. Timing is a big one. Communication is a big one. Finding out, you know, the tasks that we either need to get more skills in, um, invest in those skills, yep. but also delegate if need be, because yep. sometimes we really just don't have the time to be doing it and we don't make the time to do something if we're not enjoying yep. it. 
Um, and then we've gone through into the, you know, those communications and those plannings. So is there any other main tips and tricks that you would bring into, you know, the farm office and the farm books when we are trying to get all of this done? Look, I think you've really summarised the key points there. It's about understanding yourself and your own skills, your own ability. And I think, you know, I really get people to write it down. Like you think, oh, I do this and I do that and I manage the kids and I manage this and perhaps I do that. Write it down and take a stock take of your week. Okay, this is the amount of time I spend doing A, B and C. And you'll soon realise if you actually have the time and the capacity to be doing the office and you're dead right. Is it priority? Is it where my skills lie? Do I enjoy it? Or am I far better off out in the paddock? Or am I far better off doing my off-farm job or whatever it is and delegating to someone who might be able to do it in half the amount of time that I can and without the mistakes? And that's that's a really hard thing to do. Because, well, it was for me anyway, saying, okay, this is not my gig here. I'm handing on some of the tasks, which I did in, um, in our business simply because they were not my thing um but letting go is hard so I think letting go saying no um and and really being true to yourself in your skills your ability and what you enjoy doing um is really important yeah, yeah. so Alison once we've got you know the basics of all those sort of covered Going back to an office location, you know, is there a lot of us try and get it done at home with the kids on the farm? Is that sometimes the best setup for us because it's convenient, because we store everything here? Or is it sometimes best to take yourself, you know, in the car down the paddock or into town? What is your advice around setting up a farm office that suits you, that is customised oh. to you and your role? I love this topic and I've actually just completed a spring office um, challenge in my community and, um, yeah, I've had everyone from, you know, having offices on the kitchen table to, you know, a corner in a spare bedroom to on the couch, wherever it might be. Um, I think to be at your most productive, you really need a space that is inviting and a place that you're happy to go to and that you um yeah you can be productive in so I do encourage um whether it be in the home or you know there might be some old shearers quarters or a corner of a shed or a spare bedroom whatever it is I do encourage people to have a space that they can call their office because otherwise the lines become far too blurred am I in the kitchen cooking dinner or am I here doing office work and um you know I think I think really having you know distinguishing those areas um is you know is is far more effective than than blurring the lines so i know that's not always possible um but where it can be i think it's about you know yeah, finding a space and finding a home for everything the other thing i'm really big on is clutter and absolutely nothing worse than coming to your desk or wherever it is and there's things everywhere opportunities are lost paperwork is lost you know it's just an instant chaos anxiety oh my god what am I missing kind of situation so wherever your situation is is wherever your office space is I really encourage that everything has a home you know whether it be the land newspapers where is their home otherwise they pile up and they scrunch things up and they get in the way yeah um, I actually in my office have a tray just for kids stuff so kids you know if you want me to keep that piece of artwork which is totally great <laughs> the pile gets a bit high <laughs> this is your tray um and uh, obviously, because I wear different hats, the farm, the um, my business, my husband's business, um, bits of other things that I do, I'm really big on everything having a home so that the clutter doesn't build up and get, um, you know, form chaos. So when you are at your desk, wherever that might be, you can be really effective and efficient in whatever you're, um, you're doing. So, yeah, as I said, I understand that doesn't kind of work for everyone and everyone's situation is unique but um that's a good starting point is just to reassess your situation and and you know is there a better place for my office or can I choose an area and you know only has to be a small area but how can I most effectively work in this and use this space yeah and what would be your you know top items that you would say are must-haves to make up a farm office say you've moved to the farm for the first time or well, you're taking on the office work for the first time, what are the, the essentials that you need to have a functional work office? 
Yeah, look, I think um, a good desk and a good chair are first and foremost, um, an appropriate size desk and a, and a good chair. Um, and then the storage. The storage is the big thing. And look, I know paperless, people talk paperless. You know, that is totally an individual thing and I certainly don't advocate for that if it's not for you. But as I said, it's about finding a home for everything. So what is your storage? Um, I don't have vertical files anymore. I love colour coding if you haven't picked up on that already. And I have <laughs> folders of different colours for different things. Um, so, yeah, having a clear storage system whether that be whatever it is, just as long as it's clear. And I use the analogy if um, someone, you were to take an extended holiday for six months, could someone step into your farm office and find what they needed? <laughs> and it's a yeah. big test and it's always a big eye-opener when I mention that in a, in a mastermind. But when people work through that and do, um, I guess, reassess their filing systems and how things are filed and how things are labelled, um, it's it's a real game changer because eventually they get to the stage where, hey, someone easily could come in and find something without having to call me if I'm in the Bahamas or wherever. So Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and even with the transition, so I've talked in a couple of interviews about, you know, that succession transition as well. I know that it's still not commonly talked about on a lot of farms. You know, we don't talk about the S word. But if something was to happen and the books needed to be handed over, you know, Remember how the books were handed to you. Would you like to be doing that to someone else or would yeah. you be like to be setting up that process as you just talked about so that they're a little bit more informed and they've got, you know, we you know, we talked policies and procedures earlier, but I don't think we need to be afraid of that word. It doesn't mean anything corporate. It doesn't mean anything, you know, very, you know, logistical and over the top. It could just be you know, this is the accountant, <laughs> this is yeah. his contact, this is where we get this data from, this is where yeah. this is stored. Like let's um, set those up so that, you know, we're helping ourselves as a reminder because some jobs we only do every 12 months. So it's nice to have that reminder just to trigger our memory, but it's also nice for, yeah, definitely setting that up for someone else to do it. Totally agree, totally agree. And I remember vividly when my mother-in-law handed me all of the books and, there was a lot of paper and a lot of this is how things are done and it was overwhelming. Yeah. And over time I, I followed her process and procedures for some time and then I was brave enough to find a different way. So my other tip would be there's not only one way to do things. Find your own groove in what you have to do. Find your own methods. Um, find what you're comfortable with. And you're dead right. If you can record it so that next year when you have to do it, if it is one of those annual tasks, um, You've recorded the system of how how you do it, what you need. Um, that can be a big game changer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, Good Alison, stuff. that brings us towards the end of the interview for today. So thank you for coming on the Rural Mum and helping us set up our farm office once we've moved to the farm for the first time or we've married our farmer. Was there any final words, tips, tricks, and hacks that you are would like to provide with us today? Oh, no, look, it's been a pleasure to, to talk to you. And obviously, you resonate very strongly with this circumstance. So I think we've covered everything. But all I really would end in saying is be true to yourself, be true to your values, um, and, and find what it is that works for you. Yeah. Absolutely. And Alison, you've spoken about your business and your Facebook page. So where can people find you? Yeah, look, I'm on the socials on Facebook. The Functioning Farm Office is my group. I'd love you to join. Or my website is simply alisonhamilton.au. So I can be found there as well. My email address and everything are on that. Beautiful. I will add all of those into the show notes today for those who are looking to have a bit more of a deep dive into their farm office and working out those tips, tricks and hacks and how it can help and benefit them. So thank you for joining us. If you've enjoyed today's interview, please like and subscribe and refer a friend who you know that this will help. Until next time, thank you for joining me here on the farm. Mm -hmm.